afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 11th edition or 11th episode of our webinar series by the, brought to you by the University of the Philippines and the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation. The title of our webinar series is Stop COVID Deaths. So we will be talking about clinical management updates on how to fight COVID-19. I'm Dr. Raymond Francis Sarmiento, Director of the National Telehealth Center over the National Institutes of Health in UP Manila. And with me, as always, is my partner and my mentor, a special envoy of the President for Global Health Initiatives, Dr. Susie Pineda Mercado. Dr. Susie? Yeah, okay lang. Hello, Raymond, and uh, good day to everyone who's on us, with us on the webinar. And for those who are watching us on the playback, uh, our webinar is series is now on its 11th uh, episode. And uh, Raymond, I think I'm going to break our protocol a little bit. I just want to say na ang daming nakikinig from all over the country. No, As I was looking at the chat box, we have people listening from Coronadal, San Pablo, Cotabato, from the Institute of Aging, National Institutes of Health, UP Pediatrics Department, Negros Oriental, Gapan, Baguio, Cebu, Tarlac, my goodness, Iloilo, Caloacan, Muntinlupa, UP Los Baños. So, magandang araw po sa inyong lahat at uh, kami po ay natutuwa kasama niyo kami ngayong uh, araw na ito at marami po tayong matututunan. Always be remembered. Thank you, Dr. Susie. Uh, currently, we have 170 po attendees in our Zoom webinar and I'm sure uh, there are so much more who are watching po sa ating live streaming via the uh, TVUP channel over in YouTube. So for those who are watching us in the playback, uh, please stay tuned. Marami po talaga tayong pag-uusapan ngayon. Napaka-interesante. And we have a very uh, a very um, well-informed and excellent speaker po uh, on a particular topic uh, that's uh, very close to my heart, especially because uh, I've had my own fair share of accidents and I've had to undergo rehabilitation uh, oh my gosh. Oh. In, previous, in previous years po. So, uh, but uh, before we proceed uh, well, with our webinar, uh, this webinar series po will not be possible uh, without the cooperation, the hard work, and the teamwork po uh, by the UP team. Uh, so, uh, it starts po at the top at the office of the President represented here in by Executive Vice President uh, Dr. Teodoro Hermosa, the Office of the Vice President for Public Affairs by Dr. Elena Pernia, uh, and also represented by uh, AVP Rika Abad and Director Timmy Cabana of MPRO. Uh, we also have Executive Director of TVUP, Dr. Gigi Alfonso and her team. Uh, we also have our IT support uh, uh, provided po by the UP ITDC team uh, that, uh, led and directed by Director Paolo Pahe and represented also herein by Gabo Villorente and uh, Noel Feria. Uh, over at the UP Manila side, uh, thank you po to Chancellor Menchit Padilla uh, and also Executive uh, Director of the NIH, uh, Dr. Eva Maria Cochongo de la Paz and also uh, PGH Director uh, Gap Legaspi and UPCM Dean uh, Charlotte Chong. And over at the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation, po, we would like to thank uh, our partner, po, the, our partner for 11 episodes now, uh, led by uh, President and CEO, uh, Retired Brigadier General Ricardo Morales. So before I turn over to Dr. Susie for the introduction of our opening remarks speaker, uh, may I remind everyone that certificates will be provided po. And all, but Okay, I think we lost Raymond for uh, for a moment there, and that's part of our, our new new normal. Uh, sometimes there are connections. Only for those who have uh, spent at least... Okay. Raymond, okay. we lost you for a moment. Thank you. Raymond, we lost you for a moment. So maybe you have to go back a few seconds. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Susie. Uh, thank you. I, I, I think uh, it might be my internet connection anyway. Um, so uh, we just wanted to share... To everyone who is attending this webinar, uh, now numbering at 191 participants, that certificates will be provided to all the attendees who spend at least 50% of the duration of the webinar, po, along with a copy of the slide deck presentation. So uh, thank you, po, and uh, over to Dr. Susie for the introduction of our opening remarks speaker. Okay, so thank you very much, Raymond. Truly, it takes a village to make a webinar these days. 
And uh, we try to make this as exciting, as interesting, as interactive as possible and to bring you uh, people who are working on the front line. And today we're going to talk about um, uh, not, not, critical, not management of people who are critically ill, but we're going to talk about how do we take care of people who have survived COVID? Because we know that 80% of people will have mild illness and about 20% may get moderate illness, 5% may get severe illness. And those who survive moderate and severe illness actually don't just get up and walk away. They do have issues when they go back to their homes and their communities, and we're going to talk about rehabilitation. So before we do that, uh, let me introduce our special guest speaker who will just give a brief introduction. I worked with her and I've enjoyed working with her uh, she used to be the Dean of the College of Medicine of the University of Santo Tomas. So it is my honor and my pleasure to welcome our uh, special guest who will give a brief introduction on behalf of the Board of the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation, Dr. Maria Grace Garay Blas Gonzalez. Good afternoon. Since November 2019, we heard about a new emerging infectious disease, which allegedly started in China, crossed the ocean to plague Italy and other European countries, and returned to Asia. We became victims physically, financially, emotionally, psychologically. While our younger colleagues sacrificed for us as frontliners to protect us from possible infections. As senior citizens, we minimize our physical rounds and contact with patients. Since statistics showed that senior citizens and people with concomitant illness usually succumb to SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, or they are prone to more serious infection. I am sure we all learn from all the webinars PhilHealth is sponsors. This is open to all physicians all over the country. And as the cliche in this time of pandemic goes, it is okay not to be okay. If we who are well experience the impact this sudden change in our life brings, how much more the survivors of this disease go through? Today, we are honored to listen and learn from another expert. But before we begin to listen on behalf of PhilHealth, we welcome you all and thank Dr. Susan Pineda Mercado for planning this academic exercise. Welcome and good afternoon. Thank you so much for that wonderful message po from a PhilHealth board member. Uh, Dr. Maria Grace Garay Blas Gonzaga. Uh, but before we proceed po to our webinar proper, uh, I think this is the time uh, for, our, especially for those who are regulars of our webinar, for us to display our pre-test webinar questions. Uh, it's a fun quiz that we always do, and the answers are off. They are always given po towards the end of the webinar by our uh, resource speaker. So for our pre-webinar questions, uh, we have two. The first one. Uh, states the optimum time to start rehabilitation for COVID-19 patients confined in the ICU is option A, when the patient is in the ICU so the ill effects of prolonged immobilization can be mitigated. Option B, when the patient is transferred to the regular floor since the patient is usually stronger once they are in a regular room. Option C, when the patient is for discharge so the family can all participate in the recovery of the patient by providing a supportive environment. And option D, when the pandemic is over since the cost of PPE is prohibitive. So please uh, punch in your answers, po, and uh, we will wait for uh, the correct answers later on. But uh, it will be interesting, uh, the percentage and, uh, of uh, distribution of uh, attendees who... Uh, choose the correct answer po. Uh, but before we do that, we move on to the second question and states, please check as many as you think are involved uh, with regards to the mobilization of the COVID-19 patients. Uh, is it the responsibility of which? Uh, option A, the family. Option B, the nurses and nursing aides. 
Option C, allied medical staff. And option B, consultants, fellows, and residents. So please uh, uh, check as many as you think po, uh, is correct. Uh, for our first question, most of our attendees, I think around the six, uh, nearly 60% po, chose option A when the, uh, so the optimum time for them is when the patient is in the ICU. So the ill effects of prolonged immobilization can be mitigated. We'll, we'll ask uh, our resource speaker po later on what is the correct answer. So uh, uh, I think that's, uh, that's our cue to turn over to Dr. Susie for that uh, introduction uh, of our uh, guest speaker po for today. Thank you very much, uh, Raymond. And um, I think uh, a lot of people are very excited about this topic. I mean, gauging from the number of people we have on the uh, on the uh, on, on the chat box, we have more people coming in from Cebu, from Pangasinan, San Pablo. So our guest, uh, this is an exciting time. I think we 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 have a lot of people who want to know more about this. And it's my honor to introduce our guest speaker. As I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, our work doesn't end when the patient is discharged. Uh, in fact, we have to keep, take a look a little bit at how people are faring after they get uh, COVID-19. COVID and this is an area of medicine that is so important. And uh, Raymond, just going back to you, you were saying you've been in so, you've had so many injuries. Is that correct? Uh, well, it's a it's a sports related injuries. Not not that I'm I'm claiming that I'm an athlete, but I've had so <laughs> several injuries that that required uh, an orthopedic surgeon and also rehabilitation for uh, to return back to normal function. So that's uh that's why this topic is very very uh, close to me. And I've been uh, well, I've been having daily calls with uh, our resource speaker for because uh, of the many uh, many anecdotes that he has shared uh, over the course of this uh, pandemic. Yes, so very, very interesting to see uh, how we have, we provide a complete, uh, what should I say, a complete spectrum of care for survivors of COVID. And so without further ado, let me introduce our guest speaker. He is a physiatrist, a uh, specialist in rehabilitation medicine. He's going to talk to us about what do we do to help restore functioning of people who survive COVID, especially those who go through intensive care? They struggle a bit uh, getting back to their usual life, difficulties in breathing, they're uh, immobilized for long periods of time, but let me let him make that explanation. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Celso Bate. We also call him Noel. So uh, he's from the Medical City and VRP Hospital. Noel, uh, welcome to our webinar series. Good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share with you what we've learned. Thank you very um, much. Thank you very much, Noel. And uh, I love that background. Uh, of course, when you asked the question earlier about what the background is, uh, I was not able to answer it properly. But uh, you want to tell us about the background of your, of your screen? <laughs> No, it's the home of Wonder Woman. Yes. Yeah. And, and you know, so there I are think, all women there. I'm the only man there. Uh, yeah. Okay. So that's really exciting for you. <laughs> I mean, I think the thing is, uh, you know, we're having this light moment because it's always been so serious. We've been talking about, uh, about COVID and about management of patients and so on. And so I think it's just appropriate that occasionally we have this light moment and we think about the positive side. We think about the fact that so many people are in fact recovering and we do have a role, our hospitals who are listening right now, uh, do have a role in helping people get back to a better quality of life. So uh, Raymond, did you have any uh, sort of questions for Dr. Noel before he starts his presentation? No, not, not really. I'm just really looking forward to listening uh, to Dr. Bate, especially because I have heard of uh, several cases power in pre-COVID, the patient was uh, so young, lively, energetic, with no comorbidities, and then post-COVID, uh, like they're, they're, they are struggling to return to their normal function. I think uh, even reaching 60 or 70 percent of their pre-COVID uh, functional state was a bit of a struggle for them. So that's something that I would like to hear from uh, Dr. Noel and how rehabilitation medicine 
uh, plays a role po in uh, bringing them back to let's say almost full or uh, to their normal strength or their pre-COVID strength po. Okay, great. Okay, so we'll go to Dr. Noel now and um, you can go ahead and put on your slide deck, Noel. Uh, the slide is, okay, there. There we go, okay. Okay, please proceed. okay. thank you and good afternoon. Okay, in the middle of March this year, the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 as a pandemic. And our country, as well as other countries, went into various forms of lockdown to address the situation. With the rising consults in the ER, plus the rising need for hospital admissions, some services were asked to temporarily uh, cease operating. Among them would be eye centers, ear centers, ambulatory services, some nuclear medicine, and the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine. Our department with its multidisciplinary staff were all asked to temporarily shut down, go on leave, because other things were going on in the hospital. There was need to conserve the medical equipment such as PPE, and we need to mobilize more doctors into different, to the ER and the ICU to handle these urgent needs. In fact, our department was made sleeping quarters for the nurses, laboratory, and radiology technicians at that time. The other center I worked in was made into a clean emergency room. So our facilities were converted to meet the needs of the situation. And it's been four months since that time. There are many things we've learned and continue to learn about this virus. It's truly evolving. Its behavior, its manifestations, and the havoc it will leave behind, which we have to address. Um, next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Right there. Okay. I'd like to thank the organizers for allowing me to share the role of rehabilitation medicine in the course of a, re of a COVID patient. We're going to share our experiences and our learnings during this, this particular period in time. And I hope that we're able to impart our role, the specialty, our, our role of rehab in the care of a COVID patient. We'd like to make you aware of the participation we have in terms of acute, inpatient, and outpatient rehabilitation of the survivors. Hopefully, in centers that have no rehab doctor or no rehab facility, we'd like to share some practical tips that can be used by everybody to help mobilize our patients. That's very critical in what in this whole discussion we're going to hold is how to mobilize our patients safely so that we can reduce the ill effects of this immobilization or this bed rest that they're put in. And lastly, we'd like to make people more aware of the sequelae of COVID-19. Apparently, like Susie mentioned, there's things left behind, but they're finding out it's not only the, those who are confined in the hospital that will have problems. You will find out even the 80% will have problems. And that's what we're picking up right now and I'd like to share with you what we've learned. Next slide, please. Yeah. And just as of last night, these are the number of cases we're working with, uh, total cases, our recoveries, and our deaths. The number of recoveries, the one that little, uh, um, how do I say, it? stimulates some interest in my, on my behalf. Because when you say recovered, it means they're COVID negative. I'd like to see, or we'd like to see, if these people who are recovered have really gone back to their old life. Because that's what medicine is all about, especially my specialty. We give back, we make them survive whatever they go through. And then our job now is to try to bring them back to a life that they can be as full as possible, if not the old life. You have to understand that the people who got confined were really normal people. No musculoskeletal problems, maybe a little diabetes, maybe hypertension, but when you say that, there is no mobility issue. They could walk, they could talk, they could earn a living, and now all of a sudden, their lives have changed. So we're going to start looking at how we can help them and hopefully bring them back to the life that they once had. If it has to be a new normal, then so be it, but we'd like to have them reclaim that life. Next slide. Okay. In the care of the patients who have COVID-19, especially those in the ICU, many things will be going on at, at that time. 
There will be people who will uh, need intubation, who will need dialysis, who will need ECMO, all sorts of interventions, prone lying, these things that will alter the body and all these will require one thing in common, you stay in bed. All of them will have to stay there, they're intubated, they can't move, and they're sedated, and they are weaned, and then they are sedated, and they are weaned. So this is repetitive giving of, giving of drugs to help them get over their uh, intubation will be taking its toll. And as part of our role in rehab is to try to see if we can help manage certain conditions or certain situations out of these people. Eventually, we minimize their impairments and disabilities. We like to give them back their activities of daily living, be more independent, and eventually, we'd like them to return to their functional baseline. Kung saan sila nanggaling? Para they have um, to go back to their life. We're dealing now with an interdisciplinary team and with the family. That is the old way. Before COVID, when a patient would suffer a debilitating condition, the rehab would come in, plus the family. Malaking role ng family sa rehab patients. Because they're the ones who provide the cheating squad. They're the ones who provide the moral support. They provide the encouragement for their families to get better. During COVID-19, the family did not exist. They only had Zoom, they had cell phones, but aside from that, they're left pretty much on their own. And that's scary for a patient, especially when they start, when the doctor or the nurse who comes in is wearing this white suit or blue suit and has this big mask and talks funny. There's no face. And he's doing all sorts of things to you. And sometimes there are six people flipping you around. So parang it becomes traumatizing for patients. And the base of the work I'm doing, we're doing here is based on the ABCDF bundle, which is a bundle made by the Society of Critical Care Medicine, as well, or the PADIS guidelines. These are guidelines. These two guidelines are the ones that deal with analgesia, assessing for pain, breathing, trials, which the intensivists do. We're trying to look at looking at possibility of using analgesics or sedation for patients. Delirium is a big problem we're encountering. We're slowly picking up that this, this component in the care of an ICU patient is a big factor that can be prevented. Then early rehab. And the last one is family participation. In the PADIS guidelines, they brought in the important factor of sleep, tulog, because that gets wrecked inside an ICU because patients have no visual cue as to whether it's day or night. Next slide, please. Okay, I'd like to first talk briefly about the ill effects of immobilization. I'm sure many of us know about it, but I'd like to touch on certain things. Next slide, please. So parang the typical complication of immobility would be DBTs, pulmonary embolism because of prolonged lying down, atrophy or ICU acquired weakness wherein the patients just get weaker and weaker, We've noticed there are studies that show after 10 days, the quadriceps muscle will start to shrink by almost 20% just by lying down. So you can imagine the toll on standing up. Then you get weaker two to 3% per day because just by lying down. So that's a problem that we are creating in our attempt to treat our patients. Contractures is another problem because they're not being moved. So they, the joints become stiff, they become uh, difficult to move and it becomes painful to move after a while. Pressure injuries. We're seeing pressure injuries in places we've never seen before. Why? The prone lying is creating pressure sores on the anterior shoulder, the kneecaps, which normally the pressures are all in the buttocks area. So parang we're seeing all sorts of different situations now to adjust or adapt to. But, you, but sometimes the, the price of surviving are these things. But we'd like to see if we can reduce the price they will pay. And the last one is delirium. This change in mental status, being in a place that you're unfamiliar with, not seeing any familiar face, and then being drugged every, in and out. Every time somebody comes in, they ask you to breathe, they pull you out, and then they ask you to breathe. If you fail, they put you in again to sleep. Or if you're fighting the ventilator, they put you to sleep. Or if you're, they put you on prone, they make you sleep. We'd like to think, I think I'll correct myself by saying they don't sleep. Many of them have nightmares, but they don't tell us about it. The perception of what's going on may be difficult for them to comprehend. That's why they interpret it as bad dreams. And you'd be surprised about the dreams that they get. Next slide, please. 
So what are the things we were able to do at that time? So when we started doing rehab for patients, initially it was just the rehab doctor coming in because we were not, how do you say, we're not employees who could come in. If we were called, we would come in. And the way we would do it at that time, since Conti ang PPE, we go into the ICU, put on our bunny suit, but not going to the room. We stand outside the room because the ICU doors are all glass. We look inside and see the patient reading the chart, eating na namin. Then we wait for the nurse to feed the patient because the nurse didn't want to go in at any time except when it was absolutely necessary, which is feeding time. So we'd sit there for an hour, just waiting for them to, what time is feeding time, ma'am? Then they tell us and they sit and then twiddle our thumbs and wait for them to go in. Kasi takot din sila pumasok, especially in the early days. And I don't blame them. It was a scary situation at that time. So we'd have them examine the patient, we'd tell them what to do, and we'd watch them, and we'd wave at them or give them a thumbs up saying they were right in what they were doing. Because just want to be sure the patient you're working with had no other medical problems. When you say medical, means skeletal problems or other things to prevent mobilization. We give them a turning schedule, we teach them how to do passive range of motion, we teach them how to raise the hand and the foot, and then sometimes tell them if the patient could eat, to encourage the patient to feed them herself. With the range of motion, um, I have to under admit that some nurses were not excited because it meant them staying in longer than absolutely necessary. So we explained to them that maybe as a huling tawad sort of discussion, siguro when you feed your patient to the NGT at let's say 9 o'clock, baka I can move the right arm. After you twiddle, you fix the IV lines and uh, look at the drain, the Foley cutter and all these other nursing duties, maybe you can move the arm. Then you come back after four hours. Bakit? You feed ka na naman. Then do the left arm naman. Parang konting galaw-galaw, move it, we teach how to do it. And then the leg would get its share at five in the afternoon. And at nine, the right left leg would get its share of mobilization. So parang these are things we thought of and many liked it. Okay? Then the other thing we realized was that in that situation, our, we don't know our patients. I mean, we don't, it's not a typical patient that you can talk to the family, try to understand who this patient is and what he used to do. So you're seeing the chart. And we realized that some of them could not see anymore because they needed their glasses or their hearing aids. But we didn't know that. So we were just going about our business without realizing that these two factors play a role in their delirium. They can't see, they can't hear well, and it becomes traumatizing for them and they don't understand what's going on. So what are the barriers we encountered at that time? Siyempre, the COVID. It was a severe illness for many patients, especially here in the ICU. And all sorts of tubes sticking in your nose, in your throat, in your urinary bladder, in your arms, wherever they could put a needle in, they'd stick it in because you needed to do that. So they were severely ill. And the fear of the infection. Many of us were so afraid of the infection, catching the disease. So I, Times inside the rooms were very minimized, trying to make it as efficient as possible, then not staying, um, then trying to get out as soon as possible. Then isolation, patients were left alone. Typically, we'd talk to the family to get a consent and explain what we were doing. We're doing it all by phone. We'd explain to the patient what they were doing and they'd understand, but now, no. Then the PPEs were hard to come by. It was difficult at that time, especially the masks and the goggles and all these things were expensive us to procure. And of course, the lack of manpower, especially with the rehab. So the doctors that were the ones doing the work and we would ask each other, ask the nurse to help us if they could at the time. So what were the solutions we looked at? Thankfully, many nurses were very receptive to the idea of having them help us. It's just an additional few minutes that they were willing to do. I've had a patient that I was able to work with na physician na we would contact each other by cell phone. Hindi pa mag zoom noon eh. So cell phone na kami text text to understand. The nurse would take a picture of an extremity, I'd explain it, and then we'd try to work on it. So parang ganon. But all, but no talking. It's all by texting lang. If you notice, there's a gray slide there. The, the certain words are gray, are made gray. Because we eventually used the email to contact them because we have, I've had patients who were able to have a 24-hour bantay, believe it or not. Some of them had relatives that willing to go in and stay with them for 24 hours, seven days a week until discharge. So that's a big factor for us, for them to help their family do that. I was patsofa ko sa kanila. 
Then we also start trying to train our therapists and our other people how to wear the, the how to don and doff the PPEs in preparation for one day where they were going to come in. We start telling them when the lockdown started, you better start reading up and learning how to put on the PPEs because I think that's going to be the new normal. You have to learn to put it on and put it off. The infections occur when we make a mistake. So you have to start understanding how to properly use this. And of course, you try to start thinking of ways how to make the sessions um, time efficient, effective, but efficient because trying to stay too long inside might be a problem. Next slide, please. So the things you'd like to do in the ICU would be to improve muscle strength, at least to try to get them to lift their hand, put the spoon into their mouth. The other thing that we have can do is to help decrease mechanical ventilation duration because they're getting more efficient, getting stronger. They can start sitting up. We try to sit them up, but we were very careful that we don't extubate them unnecessarily. And it, they can be sat up because especially they're just, they were patients who had no previous medical, no previous uh, medical illness or musculoskeletal problem. They can be sat up, but it requires a village to do it or at least more than one person to set them up. And you, you notice it helps to reduce delirium. They get very confused. But at least when you talk to them, explain things, or at least see this human contact, it helps in their uh, delirium. And lastly, we were thinking of how this discharge, how their discharge would eventually turn out to be. So we'll see. Next slide, please. Uh, during that lockdown, a few therapists and my and, um, few cons and the consultants of my hospital did this. We decided to think of a way, since our department was closed, how we could try to help our patients. So we thought of pictures, created a handout that could be given to patients to help them deal with this illness. That's why a lot of them are just very simple, but they're very effective. One, the first picture shows a person putting his hand on his chest and his stomach. We'd like to teach them breathing. Patients who are in who have COVID. Can, be, have, can have difficulty breathing. And the typical breather tends to panic breathing. They breathe very shallow. We'd like to teach them to go back to diaphragmatic breathing, breathing with the diaphragm. So the hand is placed on the chest and on the stomach. And when you're inhaling, the stomach, the hand to stomach starts to move up and down. That tells you you're breathing correctly. That reassures you that your breathing is more efficient and more effective. Then we teach them to move, raise their arms, move their arms forward and backward because they're very stiff, bending the leg, the typical quadriceps exam, uh, quadriceps exercises, quad setting, which we do for orthopedic patients, but this can be done by these people, at least to get their muscles to, the quadriceps to lock when they stand, so in preparation for eventual standing. And then the uh, ankle pumps or dorsal flexion attempt to get more circulation, to prevent tightening of the heel cord. And lastly, to sit them up. To assist, to expect them to sit up alone might be impossible, but if you assist them and they're willing, by all means, sit them up. Just be careful about the tubes and the IV lines. Look out for all of them before you start mobilizing your patient. You should make them sit nearest to the ventilator because the risk of pulling it out is uh, lower when the tubes are closer to the ventilator. You have to also start relocating your Foley catheters, your IV lines. If they're on a, on a uh, IV pole, you have to just do a lot of line, it's called line management, looking at where you can put the stuff so that the patient is more easily, uh, is easy, more easily mobilized. Next slide. Then eventually they move to the floors. That's parang a graduation of sorts. And they start getting out of the rehab, of the ICU, and they now go to the floors. And many of them are still COVID positive at that time because they're now downgraded from the intensive care to a very step down unit. We teach them transfers, do the exercises, try to reorient them. And if you notice when they go there, a lot of them have sleep problems. What's a simple trick to solve this? And um, the sleep problem appears because their sleep has been shut because of the sedation and the, they don't know what time of day it is. So the idea is to just simply open all the blinds. So they know it's morning, but they're asleep, tatay, umaga. Kung tulog ka, gigising kita kasi umaga. Huwag kang magalit. And same thing at night. Because at night, they're awake. Tatay, gabi. Tulog ko kayo. Yung that kind of situation is going to take place. But at least that feedback to the patient will help them realize that, oh, sleep is done at a certain point in time. And the fear of moving patients who have not slept, uh, not, it's kind of unfounded. Kung napuyat, eh di napuyat. 
is help them overcome that because that's the only way they can, there's no tablet to make them improve their sleep. The only way to do it is to get them back on track to the regular time, the regular way life goes on, which is daytime we're awake, at nighttime we're asleep. Then the other problem we dealt with was dysphagia. Being intubated for more than two weeks, typical intubation mga three days, five days, seven days in the ARDS. The data we're, we're using is mostly based on acute respir respiratory distress syndrome and ICU cases. Nothing of the magnitude of COVID-19 that patients are intubated three times, extubate, intubate, extubate, intubate, or the tube is left in for two weeks, three weeks, bakit hindi mawin eh. So this present problems with the swallowing mechanism and they have to be helped with that in that regard. I'm grateful for the therapists we worked with because they were very brave. It was time to come in and they were coming, no second thoughts, pasok, tulong tayo sa pasyente. And I'm very grateful that there are still people who are like that in this time. Anyway, so the feeding, with the dysphagia, the other thing we looked at was we would work with the nutrition NMS, the nutrition medicine specialists. Why? We wanted to make sure they were eating adequately. When we doctors make rounds, sometimes we ask our patients, kumain na po ba kayo? And they all say yes. Without realizing, he only took three spoonfuls. And that's, he asked him, eh, busog na ho ako eh. And that's not the answer we want to hear. What do I mean? Your body will look for energy sources. You're rebuilding your body. You're rebuilding your bed sore. You better have good quality intake to allow your body to process the medications, to allow your skin to heal, and to allow your muscles to get strong. If you're not, if you're not eating adequately, it's better to keep the NGT in place. Because in that situation, you get all your medications, you get all your food, and your body starts to improve. The virus, again, we encountered to that was the severity of the infection and, and the illness that they had. And in fact, during one of the rounds we were making, I overheard a nurse make a comment to her co-nurse. Yung tao sa rehab, ang tagal sa loob, ah. Interesting comment to make. But it takes a certain amount of time to teach your patients how to do certain things. And I guess if you're properly outfitted, meaning you have your gowns, you have your face shields, you have your respirators, I think you're good to go. In fact, some page, some of our staff have even bought their own respirators. And some of our nurses have even bought their own respirators because it's scarce. They decide to invest in something they can use for long periods without having to share it with anybody. And I think that's a good idea. Instead of bragging about the new shoes you buy, brag about the newest PPE you bought or the newest mask you bought. That might be a good solution to the situation right now. You're helping the hospital, helping your patients keep yourself healthy as you deliver the care that patients need at this point in time. Okay? And then the solutions we thought of, again, the nurse would come into play because the therapist would leave and then the nurse would have to come in and then they sit them up to eat. So we'd encourage them to sit the patient up using email. So I treated some of our patients we worked with with email, the program, because we couldn't write on the charts because there was a time even we weren't allowed to enter. Took a lot of bargaining, took a lot of brokering for eventually them to allow us to go in. But when we went in, we went in for, with gusto. And then last one is we try to prepare for discharge. We're looking at how they will eventually go home because now that the tubes are out, now that they're eating, the next part, which is the more difficult part, is rebuilding your life, getting it back. Because it's not a walk in the park. It's going to be a lot of work. I wish there was something could give patients to get them stronger. You take this pill, you take this injection, you're going to get strong. Unfortunately, in rehab, that's why we're not a very popular specialty because the work comes from, you have to work to get it. And people don't, they want that magic pill, that magic infusion to make them strong. At this point in time, voila, it's going to be work. But a graduated, gradual work, slowly pacing the work, because you know it's tiring, but it slowly helps you get back to your life. The only way to get it back is to work for it. Next slide, please. These are the basic um, specialties or the allied health person associated with rehab, physical therapists. We do a lot of pulmonary work, conditioning and mobilizing them. Occupational therapists work on ADLs, fixed daily living, and the IADL is instrumented ADLs, which I'll explain later. Speech therapists are, were important because of the speech concern of these patients. We look for alternatives or augmentative. Uh, some have used iPads. In fact, the speech association in the Philippines came out with a, a something you could print. It had pictures, it had letters. So these are things that when patients can point to a, to a picture or to a letter and spell out what they would need. A little challenging, a little difficult, but 
at least patients can express what they want, they want to do. Then the psycholog uh, rehab usually psychologist on board, unfortunately, not in the centers I work in, but the psychiatry department took a big uh, interest in the cases. They were helping people because we know that to be sick or this sick, there are many mental conditions that will be brought up that you'll have to deal with, that you'll have to address and eventually overcome because you did go through certain things. And these have to be addressed. Next slide. Okay, I'd like to talk about ADLs and IADLs. These are things we many of us don't think about, uh, but we all take for granted. But you have to understand that the, if you survive um, COVID-19, and especially if you're in the working group, because we're now we're seeing yung sinabi nila na matatanda ang tatamaan, I'd like to, how do I say that? That's an ageism, I don't agree. I am 62 years old. But having said that, there are things you have to do to bathe, to go to the toilet, to feed ourselves, to dress, to transfer from bed to chair, and to be able to hold our urine and our, our stool, and to do it at the right time. These are things that we have to start learning so that we can become more independent and become more, uh, more human. One of the patients I worked with was so happy when she was able to go to the toilet and to take a bath. She was so thrilled. And for us, it's just a bath or it's just going to the toilet. But for her, that was the big day in her life. So parang things we take for granted. And then the other one is IADLs, instrumental ADLs. These are things you have to use. Using a phone, knowing how to shop, assuming you live by yourself. You have to prepare your food, clean your home. You should um, do laundry, transportation, whether driving a car or going by public transportation, medication management. And of course, finances. One of the patients I worked with, that was her biggest issue when we were, she was recovering. Because it was tax season at that time. Sabi niya, Doctor, yung taxes ko. Wow. At this point in time, you're thinking of that. But I said, that's what makes you happy. It's a concern. It should be addressed. It was a bad concern because tax season in the Philippines is April 15, if I'm mistaken, the old time. Well, that's when COVID started hitting us. So her concern was her taxes. Next slide. Okay, we designed this, we decided to shoot these pictures in an attempt to try to help our patients um, become more mobile. If you notice the first one was almost also done in bed. Now the patient has to sit up already. There's some certain exercise they can do. That spirometer is a useful instrument. We like that, especially it's given by the pulmonologist because it gives the patient a number to work on. But the sad part is sometimes the instruction does not include the number. They say, do as well, much as you can. I think with patients to understand what we're doing, we have to give them a number. Sir, try today 500. Yun muna ang tiyagain nyo. Pag hindi gumabot ng 500, huwag niyo ibilang yan kasi kailangan 500 ang minimum. Or whatever number you decide. But that's something they hold on to para every day say, I have to do 250, then I will do 250 again, and then later on 500. You know, getting the numbers higher and higher, but it shows them, this a visual feedback that I am getting better. Why? I'm breathing more now. My lung has bigger capacity. And that translates to more physical activity. I'm more functional. I'm able to do things. I'm less tired. Then these are other range of motion exercises. Try to get them to sit and stand and even tiptoe because they should start walking at this time to become more independent. Next slide. Yeah. When you're preparing for discharge, so eventually after discussing with the patient and they're cleared to go home and they've had their two negative tests, we're deciding they have to go home already. They've been in the hospital too long. So follow-up consults where they become face-to-face -face or uh, teleconsult is something we discuss. But then the other thing that's more important to discuss would be the challenges that set up at home. Where do you stay? Are there stairs in your home? Will there be a caregiver for you? Will you be able to go to the toilet? You might have to use a commode, use a walker. Is your nutrition support going to be enough? Will you have enough ways to obtain the proper food? And all these other challenges. And that they have to work at home. You have to understand the difference between therapy and exercise. Therapy is when a therapist comes and does things to you to teach you. But exercise is every day. 
That's what people have to understand. That if I want to get myself better, I have to do my share, not rely on the therapist or the allied health person to do the work or the nurse. You have to start doing things on your own to get your body stronger. The other thing we realized was cognitive challenges would start to appear, becoming forgetful, becoming unable to plan things. That part you will see later on when we talk about the complications we're expecting. The last part, the emotional and psychological, is something we don't talk about. When I see we, I, my patient told me about it on the last day when she was going home. She was a, by the way, doctor, by the way, I have these bad dreams. And wow. But unfortunately, we couldn't discuss it. I tried to catch her again through email to get her to talk to her about it. But there was no response from her end. But that's something we're looking at. That's why the way they combat that is because patient has been put to a lot of, you know, flipping, a lot of turning, a lot of inserting that can be misunderstood or misinterpreted. There is a move in the States called the ICU diary, which I don't know if it can be done here, but the idea is doctors, nurses write in a diary to tell the patient what they were doing at that time. And on this chart, the patient gave the diary and the patient looks at it and they're able to, so they understand that, oh, on this day, I felt like drowning. They were suctioning me lang pala. Yung ganon. So it's just understanding that things that they heard had basis. They're not going crazy. It's just that the interpretation was different. Unless we were telling people when you sedate patients, they're probably not, they're not sleeping. They're, they're probably having nightmares. And that's the sad part. Because we'd like to think, pag pikita mata, tulog yan, di ba? Some of them have reported hearing things, hearing conversations. So it tells us that it's a different realm. They're in a different situation. We, they're not sleeping and they're not having pleasant dreams. Next slide. Yeah. Uh, we'd like to just show you this slide from our uh, work by Koropulo. It just talks about the possible long-term sequelae of critical illness. But to understand the data or the things I'm talking about, we're based on acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS or prolonged ICU stay. The stays that the patients have now and the illness they have, we've not seen them in a while. We've, ne we've never seen them. Be an event for two weeks, three weeks, typical. Having to do all sorts of things to you, sabay sabay, parang hindi, not the usual thing. And then we're seeing it as, a, as the COVID unleashes its wrath. And so we have to tell the primary patients there will be pulmonary problems. That is why the breathing exercise is important. You've got to get your breathing correct and efficient. The analogy I tell my patients like being thrown into the sea and you're out far from the beach. Do not flail. Go slow. You will get to the beach. But if you don't know what to do, you're going to panic. You're going to breathe like crazy. You're going to do what you call hingal kabayo, hingal aso. The idea is to slow it down. Breathe properly. Use your diaphragm so that the diaphragm and the breathing outside, the first deep breathing, wherein you slowly breathe the air out, there's still extraction of, of oxygen from the air that came into your lung. So it's an efficient use of air. Your lung muscles will fatigue if you breathe. Uh, uh, if you go with takip niya, you breathe heavily and quickly, uh, it will tire. That is why you have to start learning to slow it down. There is air. Just have to make use of it correctly. Next slide. Yeah. Neuromuscular concerns. The muscles will become smaller. You will see that. Their thighs, their calves will be so soft and they can develop all sorts of weakness. Can't even put a spoon in their mouth. Can't sit up by themselves. And to think that they before, they were doing these things without even thinking about it. So the need to address this and tell, reassure them it will come back, but you'll have to work on it. You're not giving up. When we're sending you home, so she said, it's just the beginning of rebuilding. So you have to do a lot of work. Pero ma may mangyayari dyan. Tsatsagain lang talaga. Next slide. Physical function. Like to get back, get back their ability to take care of themselves. To at least to become more human, di ba? To wipe your own butt, to be able to go to the bathroom. These are things we'd like to see us do. Man, kahit yun lang magawa natin, malaking bagay. At least the first step to recovery, getting that in place. 
have to do it in a commode because I cannot walk. I'd rather do it in a commode than do it in bed wherein I'm like an infant. I'm pooping and urinating and, you know, if I can tell the nurse, nurse, they sit me up and make me urinate on a bottle, that'll be great. But yung ganun eh. But you have to understand with the COVID, it was a very difficult situation. But I think we're understanding it more now. So it's a, uh, I think we're more relaxed about the situation. We say relax, we, more, we are more confident with the way we treat our patients and we're not that rushed anymore. There's some line there about the six minute walk test. That's a test we like to use for patients, but unfortunately during the, given the circumstance now we can't do it, but we'd like that test, why? Because it's normative. There is a normal value for each age group based on height and weight which means if you don't hit the mark, even if you don't feel weak or you don't feel tired, you did not hit a number. And that tells you you have not recovered the way a 30-year-old should or a 40-year-old should or a 52-year-old, depending. So that's what we'd like to do to eventually document that there is. And they're realizing that many don't hit that number. Only one third hit it. Next slide. Dysphagia, the swallowing problem. So we'd like to work on that to get them to eat. If you have to eat mashed food, so be it, rather than eating the typical rice with meat and vegetables. If you have to mash it to make it lugao, to crush the, to mince the fish or to chop up the piece of meat, then so be it. But you have to eat correctly and properly so that you can get better. And if you have to take your supplemental drinks, by all means, do so. You'll have to get around the dysphagia. But their exercise can be done later on to help improve it. Because you first, you want to one day when you recover, you want to be able to go out and eat what you want. Next slide. Yeah, psychological, yeah. That's where the psych people come in, but you know, having to deal with the anxiety, the depression, the PTSD, the memories that haunt them will be difficult. You, uh, do you, di, di when we do our temperature taking now, we stick a thing in near the head, right? That's a typical way to take temperature now, infrared, right? One patient thought it was Russian roulette. You'd stick it to his head, click, whew, I'm okay. And the nurse walks away. Comes back again after first, click, okay. But in his head, this is it. Russian na to. So things we have to explain to our patients, seeing it from their point of view, something to look at talaga. And last one is cognition. Next slide. Uh, yeah, cognition. Because the return to work will be, no, no, not that, sorry, sorry, go back. Just with cognition. Sorry, can you go back one slide? Yes, sir. With cognition. Uh, because yeah, that's where going back to work will be a big goal for all these patients, especially the young. Even the 60-year-olds that I've seen will go back to work. Why? They are executives. They run companies. They cannot just keel over. That's why the need to, have to think, to plan, to organize things is still in their job. So the idea is now is to help them get back to that kind of a level wherein they are still directing operations or at least able to step in when the time comes for them to, re to resume their job. Okay, next slide. Yeah, these are the outpatient services that can be offered to patients. Some of them will require more uh, exercises for swallowing to get back their eating the normal diet, meaning rice and you know tough meat. Some have to get upper strength upper arm strength back to do basic ADLs or other activities. We're serializing balance is affected. That's why we need to work on their balance. The Berg, uh, there's a test we do for balance that we notice nahihirapan sila. Then of course, hand activities. Things we take for granted, the ability to use our hands for all sorts of activities has to be addressed because we will need our hands to do our daily chores. Next slide. Yeah. This was a term, post-ICU syndrome. It's a term that was coined about 20, uh, 10 years ago. It was describing, it's not a diagnosis. It's a, it's, they're describing a situation wherein patients are sent home 
with a new or a worsening impairment of physical, cognitive, and mental status. When you say worsening, it's probably pre-existing for some patients who are a little depressed or anxious, it becomes magnified. And this persists, this appears after critical illness and persists beyond discharge, which means there is a problem they are encountering. And our job is to be able to identify it or at least be aware it exists so we can properly guide them. Next slide. This is a, a study in the States was done. They noticed that about the PICS and they noticed there are two types, one that deals with the survivor and one that deals with the family. And I think the family now, we've given the present situation, I've not, you have not seen your loved one, you cannot give any moral support, you cannot talk to them, you cannot see them. It becomes traumatic for people. We've had patients die and they don't see anybody after that or before that. Right? It's sad that you know your loved one died alone. Very sad. But given the time, what it's the way it is. So you have to start working around it and helping them overcome that difficulty. And say for the survivors, there are things that they have gone through and it makes their life, their return to life more difficult. And we have to support them and help them. And one way to do to help them is to try to reduce the effect by getting them to be more mobile, getting them to do things so that they realize, oh, there is light after the tunnel. I will get better. It's just a matter of me doing a lot of work or some work to get better. Next slide. And for the mental health problems, we're noticing these statistics. But again, like I said, these are all for ARDS and uh, uh, ARDS and how do you say, say ICU confinements, but we're seeing, so, but, but these are for confinements are not very long. 30% are depressed, one third are anxious, and PTSD appears in 20%. So parang, we hope that these numbers will be contained, but if you extrapolate that information, you look at somebody who's been in the hospital for, for the ICU for two weeks, three weeks, you might expect this to go up higher, but we don't know. So we have to be prepared to, to address this group and meet them and help them. Next slide. Cognitive, yeah, this one, something we, how do you say this? Yeah, it, this makes or breaks many of us, especially if we are working in a, if you're physicians, because I work with physicians also, or if you are a executive, a businessman, this is important. If you want to run your business, get back to your life, pay the bills, you need this to get you back to maintain employment. And the statistics here are shown that at this charge, 70% have some cognitive impairment. Pero siguro dahil nagkasakit, medyo mahinahin. Pero after a year, 40% still have problems. So parang what happens to them? The companies will not keep their slots open for them. Either take a down, uh, cut in pay, or they switch jobs, or they retire. But how many can retire at this point in time? Next slide. Next slide. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. The role of rehab in PICS is actually just we're trying to see at least if you get them more mobile, get them to sit up, the strength and the weakness can be addressed. So, their functional capacity starts getting back, they become more oriented. And the reason why I should pick, chose these pictures is because to remind me or to remind us that that was the old life. The new life is it's going to be more challenging, more difficult. That's why the data that I present or the information I present, we don't know what COVID will do to us or to, to our patients down the road. But we have to be prepared because that's the bottom line. We have to be willing to meet that population and address their needs. In fact, in the States now, they have what they call PICS clinics because they're realizing marami talaga nag problema. So they're setting up clinics in hospitals that address nothing but this type of problem. So these patients realize they're not alone, they're not going crazy. They're just not in their head. There is something going on and they have to be helped. The effect of mobilization on cognitive and psychological status, we still are iffy about it, but we know that delirium affects cognitive thinking. And delirium can be caused by medications, can be caused by too much lying down, can be caused by sedation, and all this can play a role. And our job is to try to see what we can control so patients can start becoming more oriented. There's a test we do called the confusion assessment measure. We ask patients certain questions. We ask them to see if they can think straight. 
they can, you move on to an organized type of thinking and see how their thinking process is evolving so that we can help them better. Because they realize that delirium can be a negative risk factor for recovery. Next slide, please. And then they notice when the studies done in the other countries and states, particularly, they notice only one third go back to work after one to three months. That's for ARDS, not for SARS, not and SARS, not for COVID. And at six months, only two thirds go back to work. So where's the other, where are the people now? So we're trying to look at that. And you think these were healthy individuals who just got the flu, as some people like to call it. And now their lives have totally changed. So to look at how we can help them get back to that life. If not go back to work, to not be, to be independent at home so that somebody else can earn a living while they're at home recuperating or doing their housework. Because if you were the breadwinner and you can't go back to work for whatever reason, at least if your wife leaves or the spouse leaves you at home, she knows you're not going to burn the house. You're not going to, you know, do something crazy in the house because she knows you can clean the house, you know, or at least feed yourself, know where to put the microwaves and stuff like that. Next slide. This one is the one I wanted to bring up now because hey, the topic that we discussed with Susie talked about critical care patients. Realizing these are the other patients. The 80% who have, oh, flu lang yan, mild, higa ka lang. Take, uh, NS, uh, take uh, paracetamol, take fluids, eat well, sleep, isolate, you'll be good to go. Study uh, in UK showed one tenth or ten percent would be called long haulers. They will take time to recover, and I've worked with some of them. One of my patients, physician, the down she got better now. The next day, started to throw out the trash and do all sorts of things. Ah, that afternoon, bulag tawle. So it's not as simple as we'd like to think it is. The patient I was talking to Raymond about, a thirty-nine-year-old female who used to bike to work, clock in twelve hours bike home. Now she can't even do four hours of work from home. By the fourth hour, her mind gets foggy already. And before 12 hours, kayang kaya, maning maniyan. And to think, less than 40 years old, very active lifestyle, and you still get hit, hit hard. Next slide. The press is the one picking up this population of people. People are reporting that three months in, I'm still weak. I'm still, what are the long-term effects? What are we dealing with? We're realizing that this COVID thing is really an evolving beast. It really has all sorts of things that can create. And we, I hope, well, I hope we're not at the iceberg. I hope we're already at the bottom of the iceberg, but I don't know. Pero talaga, we have to be aware, get ready for these people to come in and help them because we have to get back all our lives. Next slide. Yeah. What is the post-COVID syndrome they're describing? Fatigue brought about by activity. The activity doesn't have to be physical in nature. It could be mental in nature, which is the irritating part. To think, which most of us do, can be tiring. And that's not good to hear. Poor sleep. The sleep is not refreshing. We have a disturbed sleep. I guess because you've been sleeping the whole day when you had this flu-like symptom, you've been lying in bed, you couldn't breathe, so you're flipping, flipping around. I guess your sleep cycle gets so shot, but you eventually have to go back to a regular sleep cycle. And this cognitive dysfunction. But you realize you can't think, you can't remember what's causing it. And some have theorized that might be the cyc cytokine storm they're describing, of course, in, ma in big magnitude, magnitudes in the ICU, but I guess if you have a mild form, it's also there. But I guess to a lesser degree, that's why you don't need too much intervention, but I think it still wrecks havoc. It becomes problematic for these people. And it's sad because it's frustrating. And I wouldn't be surprised if they get depressed because you know, I could do so much work before and now it's so hard. Anyway, that's so why we have to be ready for them and help them. Being aware, I think, is a big step so we can guide them and help them go the right way. Next slide. Yeah, in the post COVID syndrome, what can we offer patients? One is an individualized program. The patients I've worked with, we've had to go back and forth. Too hard, pull back. Too easy, we go forward. Pull back again. You know, it's really difficult. And sometimes the irritating part is they do the bed exercises with, and they still have a hard time. That's the frustrating part. 
Because you tell me, you can still go to the bathroom, do your other things, like eat in a chair, but when you do the exercise, you have to do it in bed. Kasi hirap na hirap na sila. There's, this is where the occupational therapist comes in, the energy conservation techniques and pacing. You might have to teach them how to pace their work. But typical scenario, most of us, when we're going to go to the bathroom to bathe, we bring our shampoo, then you say, oh, I forgot my towel, you go out and get your towel. Oh, I forgot my soap, you go out and get your soap. And you know, it's back and forth, back and forth, or going up and down the stairs, I forgot this. And I, forgot. I think you'll have to start looking at what am I going to do? What do I need so that when I have the, all the equipment I need, I will sit in the table and do the work. Everything is here already, including my coffee, including my chips, if that's what you're going to eat during the, your work. Then the issue of adequate nutrition. This is something all of us brush aside, but you have to think about it. You have to eat correctly. I'm sorry to say, but fast foods are not the best thing, but that's what we all ate during COVID. Ang joke na eh. You see that joke, I'm sure. Eh. It's a picture of a muscular guy and after post-COVID, we're all big as elephants. Because you know, we're eating all sorts of things. Eh. You have to learn to start eating better and eating wisely and adequately. Kasi iba nga, hindi ko gusto yung lasa nito. Right? There's a taste issue for some COVID patients. Hindi masap to, ayoko kainin. That's not what we want them to, de- to how to deal with it. It's still the same food. Just try it. You have to start swallowing it. Imagine a child learning to eat vegetables for the first time. Anak, lunokin mo lang yan. Okay yan, kasi lalakas ka. And the issue of proper rest. In this particular case, kasi they're saying bed rest is bad for them. We're saying there is such a thing as proper rest, adequate rest. But the patient actually use a pulse oximeter to guide him when he felt something was happening. And his O2 sats, we have, you have heard of the happy hypoxics. People are hypoxic but feel good. But when they put on the pulse oximeter, the numbers are low. And that's scary. They still sit down, rest, do deep breathing until the pulse oximeter responds and gets improves and raises the number of their oxygen content. So rest is still why uh, uh, wisely spaced rest would be something to look at. Next slide. Yeah. So in summary, what have we learned? In COVID nineteen, its effect on people, we have played a role in the care and re- recovery of these people, but the entire medical team plays a big role. We all have to help each other to get this one patient to go home and get back his or her life. All of us. That's why who's who's responsible to mobilize? Everybody. The family's not around because it's COVID. It's the consultant's job, the fellow's job, the resident's job, the allied health's job, the nurse's job, the nursing aide's job. In fact, when I was making rounds one time, I saw this intensive pulmonologist, you know what she would do? She'd literally make the patient sit at the edge of the bed with the trait, uh, with the intu- with the ET tube and listen to the lung. That's the way we help our patients. If they can sit up, that few minutes you make them sit up, sir, sandali, I want to listen to your lungs. In the back and in the front. Because most of us, they sit in the front lung. Okay na yan. Without realizing the back lung plays a big role. It is to sit them up, listen to all the lungs, do, uh, do some palpation, do some chest expansion, you know, that kind of thing. The basic medicine, but done in the proper position. That would help a lot in our patient's recovery. And you have to understand that the role starts from the acute phase. It's not in the regular room. And that's where everybody's to be on the same page. Rehab is difficult. It is challenging, but it's the only way to get back your strength. Until one day, somebody will discover that magic pill, or that magic infusion that made Steve Rogers Captain America, but it doesn't exist. So we're now stuck to Batman. Exercise, diet, doing all these things to get better. And lastly, you have to be aware of the, co- of the complications of COVID-19. And it's a quelle. It's a long journey. Sabi nga iba, it's a marathon. You have to be ready for the marathon. Walang iwanan, we'll all work together and we'll cross the finish line one day. That's it. Thank you and for listening and good afternoon. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Noel. That was particularly interesting and I'm sure that uh, a lot of us, including me po, uh, are hankering to ask you uh, several questions. But before that, we have our uh, well post-presentation uh, evaluation form. Uh, it's a <laughs> Uh, so, so just to be able to uh, gauge uh, how how the presentation 
struck to the our to our attendees po. Uh, and true to true to form, a lot of our uh, of our attendees, a uh, majority, more than 95% or 90% of our attendees uh, found the presentation uh, as was well prepared and organized. It was very well received. Uh, you demonstrated to sir a thorough knowledge of the webinar topic. Uh, there were no issues in terms of um, the use of uh, inappropriate or uh, difficult to understand jargon and speaking audibly and clearly really helped you convey your message in particular when you were using for your uh, anecdotes uh, and talagang bihas ang bihas na po kayo pag deliver po ng webinar. So thank you. To everyone, please, uh, please uh, put in your answers po dito po sa ating uh, post-presentation assessment. And uh, to date, uh, at, at this moment, we have 275 participants uh, who are in Zoom. And I'm pretty sure mas marami pa po uh, yung nandun po sa ating uh, YouTube uh, channel uh, over on our live stream. Uh, before I turn the floor over to Dr. Susie for the first question, I, I'd like to... Um, share to our present uh, to our uh, guest speaker for Dr. Noel and also to our attendees uh, the uh, the distribution po of our um, registrants and attendees we have people who registered from the Philippine Association of Speech Pathologists in Nueva Ecija uh, Region 3 Central Luzon from the Labo 3 Rural Health Unit in Labo Camarines Norte Bicol Region we also have attendees from Cebu Rehab Medics, Cebu City in Central Visayas, also from the Sambuanga del Sur Medical Center in Pagadian City, Sambuanga Peninsula, and the DOH Caraga TB Reference Laboratory, Surigao City, and Caraga. And true to form, again, Dr. Noel, uh, our webinar is also international. That means uh, your presentation and you specifically are international po, no? So we have attendees from the Carson Adult Day Healthcare Center in Carson, California, the United States, Almasara Hospital in Muscat Gala, Oman, and the Central Security Hospital in Al-Qasim, Saudi Arabia. So uh, uh, I'll turn the floor over to Dr. Susie. Susie? Thank you very much, Raymond and Noel. Thank you so much. I mean... Thank you. Now, throughout these webinars, we have it's it's a brilliant presentation. I mean, we throughout these webinars, we've been talking about survival. You know how to keep people alive. I think you brought a very, uh, which is a very deep dimension on what care really means. And um, just uh, listening to what you're talking about in relation to how traumatic the experience can be and how we actually don't really ask patients how they are. And we really now, I think now that we know a little bit more about infection control, the virus and all of that, uh, we can have a more humane or emphatic, use our empathy more for our patients. And I think the other point is that this is not, as you say, it's a marathon, no? So there's longer term sequelae and uh, okay, so I'm looking at some of the questions here, but one of them I think is relevant. You know, one one uh, participant is asking, well, if you're you have a lot of money and you're in a hospital that can do rehab, then it's okay. But how about poorer patients? So what what do we suggest? You know, I was just thinking about that question, I thought maybe we should be creating patient support groups online you know, for survivors. I don't know, it's just a thought, but let me throw that back uh, to you, Noel. Um, in the hospitals that don't have the setup of a physiatrist or a rehab group that can help patients, and I would think many of our hospitals are in that particular situation. What do you suggest, what, what can we do? And this is more of maybe a, a programmatic or a policy question, no? Kasi, now that we're learning more about COVID, we're now seeing that this is a need, then we need to address it in a bigger way. So uh, I think those who are listening now are aware and could try to do things, but what you're thinking now on how we, on the entire approach to management now of COVID survivors? Well, because one is to make the patients aware of what's going to happen. But parang, see, when people get sick, they expect when you go to a hospital, you go out, you're better. Think of to prime them 
that this is just the beginning. But things have to be done. Um, it's, it's like I said, when the, um, it, you, the rehab, of course, of course like, I agree with that part that so if you live in an urban area or a place with a, a rehab team, it's always better. But so I said, I started by saying there are things we can teach you to do. Right. To sit them up, to make them eat, to engage with them. Parang yung just, you have to be aware, nanay, meron ba kayong masamang natatandaan o naalaala? Sabihin niyo sa akin, mag-usap tayo. That kind of situation na parang it, things can be done. Okay. Then, yes, we have so, them eat, yeah. then... And then getting interested in their life. Because the thing we've lost with patients at this point in time is when they come in, we don't know who they are. We've lost the family. Iba yung siya going, anong trabaho ni tatay? Anong trabaho ng asawa mo? Yung ganun, you start, they start, oh. So you start getting a better picture of who you're working with. And now, it's just patient X. And that's it. Because the chart won't say much anymore. Because you can't verify any information. Right. Family's not there to, to give you more input. Yeah. That's why parang we have to just be more... I guess at that time that we started, takot tayo lahat eh. Yung to go in, gusto mo, short and out. Now, we can stay a little longer, get to know them better, trying to see what we can do to help them, talk to their families, and then just update them regularly so they have an understanding. It's an extra step for many of us to call the family, to get in touch with them, or to have the nurse get in touch with the family. Para lang, we can just update them. Para hindi nila, ah, ganito pala ang nangyayari. Salamat. Or doktor, bingi tatay ko. O di dali mo yung hearing aid para makarinig siya. Yung ganun eh. Yeah, great, Noel. I mean, the the the, the thing is, uh, as we as the pandemic continues, and you know, I think we've been saying this that COVID's not going to go away. This yeah. problem is going to be with us. We yeah. have to start making adaptations or adjustments. Yes. And I think uh, Dr. Noel has given us very graphic examples of how the practice of medicine is very different when you're looking at a COVID patient. Anyway, some more questions here. So. Oh, um, Susie. Thought, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to say one thing. Kasi yeah. We're a very caring culture. I mean, yes. when your parent is sick or your spouse is sick, what is the first thing you do? You feed them, you do everything for them. Yes. Well, that is nice, but you have to start thinking back. There's a point in time, if you can feed yourself, please feed yourself. It's not that I don't love you. It's just that get back that skill. Right. I'll sit you up. Pagodok anak, anak, nai, upo lang tayo. Sabi ng doktor, maganda. They have the pill can get this pass oximeter. Noy, normal naman ang heart rate natin. Kung pagod ka man, baka ano, pagod lang yan. Siyempre, nakapagod umupo. Pero okay lang tayo. Yung ganun eh. Kasi nga, ayoko niya kasi nakakapagod yan. But exercise is tiring. I think that's something we all have to understand that there is going to be some tiredness we will experience. So sometimes we've asked patients, I work, some patients I work with, ask them to give me the board scale from 0 to 10. When they do the exercise, give me a number that describes the fatigue you feel. Para lang we have an idea. Kasi nga, I get tired. Give me a number para I can work with you and see how hard it is or how easy it is. And take it from there. But huwag kayo matakot sa pagod. It's like exercise. But to be a good basketball player, it's not just playing. You have to start running. You have to start lifting weight. You have to start doing all sorts of things to get that skill, to get the foundation for all the skills. And it, it takes work. Nothing will make you a great player except to work. Yeah, you know? great, Noel. I mean, I think for the one who asked that question, uh, the, the answer, I mean, of course, is that even if you don't have a rehab team, uh, yeah. Dr. Noel yeah. has given us so many exercises you can see. And by the way, the the uh, presentation, you can view it again on mm -hmm. uh, TVUP, on Facebook and YouTube. And uh, you can do things. No? So I think we, the, the real thing is we really need, need to get people moving around. So it's about mobility. Mm -hmm. It's about activities of daily living. And uh, we can do that on our own. Okay, So mm -hmm. even if you don't have a rehab team, let's just keep that in mind that this is something that you can do. We can help the patients recover and acquire a better quality of life just through these simple exercises that have been shared with us. Uh, so okay. wait, I'll tell another story. Okay. Okay, get that. When we come in to work with our patients, we sit them and do all sorts of things. Then the family or the patients, nurse Puma, oh, ay hindi upo ede. Iya pa na sa inyo. Parang where did that come from? Yeah. Then I have to put in the chart. May sit up anytime. May assist to do this. Kasi nga, wala si nabing doctor. Ay hindi ho. Intay niyo riyak dun na kayo upo. 
Ito na po yan ang sagot dyan. Yes. Tulungan natin, pwede na. Pagpakain, paupuin nyo. Tulung Don't make them get up by themselves because they could fall down. But if you assist them, prop them up, help them, they should be able to sit. Yeah. Parang ganon. Yeah, great, Maybe great. Moving is not rehab's property. It's everybody can everybody. do it. Maybe we start yeah. the ball rolling, but yes. then once it starts going, anybody can sit up. Kung yan, oh, setting, not, di makatulong sa gabi, not... upo yung sa gabi kung siya upo. Oo, parang kasi ang ano dyan, na, na, umiiral dyan kasi Noel, yung takot eh, di ba? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, takot, no? And uh, I think wag tayong maging takot, no? Um, this, the problem of immobility has been well described. And as Noel says, everybody can do something to help, no? Okay, I'll give you another question, uh, Noel. This is from our colleague, Shelly De La Vega of the UP. Sure. Institute of Aging, she's saying hello, and she says, what's the criteria for early rehab? Do we have any criteria? Ah, okay. Um, well, once we rely on our intensivists to help us, meaning um, if you want objective measures, they dictate, um, there are certain blood pressure readings we look at, yeah. certain heart rate changes we look at, mm -hmm. we look at the ventilator setting, the PEEP, you know, these are things and then when they feel it's ready we come in we do assessment we reassess the patient see we try to do things for them and see how far they can go yung some of the work for the arts uh, for arts not for covid but for arts they're saying even two to three days post intubation pwede nang galawin yan uh -huh. Umpisa na. Kahit, yeah. the, okay the question should be when i when you see a patient what can this guy do even in bed what can he do if the nurse can raise his arm 10 times and the other arm and the other leg 10 times each time, oh, that's good. Yeah. That's big. But then do not confuse sitting with high back rest because that's a problem. Ay, doktor, nakakupo ni pasyente ko. Really? Oh, tinatas ko yung kamay. Naku, patay. <laughs> Hindi mo po yan. Hinay back rest mo lang. Ang upo, Ay. ang paay nakalambitin. Yes. Mga yeah. So, Tama. yeah. But, but, yeah. Then we look at, other thing to answer Sherry's, ano, we sana like a, there's a thing called the RAS score. It's a rich, rich month, uh, agitation score. We like them to be zero or minus one. This is because when you're being sedated and being weaned off, your mental status change, changes. And we like it to be more participative. Na parang nakasunod na kahit konti para they also participate in the care. Yeah, I, but I, I, it's really a decision yeah. made by the intensivist, the cardio and everything. And then we filters down to us. But then we also look at them and say, they're not ready already. Ito. Oh, oh. Noel, thanks for sharing all those scoring that you're doing. No? Kasi I think this is very important. It's a very important technique in, in health education that you always ask on a scale of 1 to 10 or you, know, you, you have a little set of questions in order to assess because most of the time we can't really understand the subjective experience no so okay so i mean i think it, i think it's great okay we've got so many questions in the question box i'm gonna ask uh raymond to read off some of them i think we have about 15 questions uh, i think raymond's gonna pick out the ones that are most relevant raymond well, get over to you thank you dr susie and uh for dr noel po we have uh like i mentioned it's not just uh physicians or nurses who are attending these uh, we also have participants who are from the allied medical professions, uh, physical therapists, and also occupational therapists. Uh, in particular, there is one here that says, uh, do you teach patients with difficulties in initiating sleep? Yung pong technique na progressive relaxation. So as an occupational therapist, she teaches that technique po and finds it very effective. Yeah, you po? meaning, that's why we ask, that's why when we deal with this, we, everybody plays a role. That's why we call, we call in our OTs and our PTs, but the simplest thing, I say, that's a good idea. Problem, there's no OT. What is the simplest thing we can do? Open the blinds. Yeah. So when the patient is sleeping and you wake up, he gets upset. Sir, umaga po. It's 10 o'clock, sir. Huwag kayong magalit. At paggabi, tatay o nanay, ang dilim-dilim na po, tulog na tayo. This habit of putting on TV, I'm not a big fan. Mm. It's just noise. Yeah. Unless it's my favorite show, then I will. I mean, I'll be engaged. But otherwise, it's just you know. Which is which is you're watching Wonder Woman again, right? Oh, 1984, yeah. But but the delay. 
Okay, sige, Raymond, you have some more uh, upcoming questions. Yes, uh, uh, Dr. Noel, how about naman po when you encounter a patient, uh, yung talagang uh, highly anxious or depressed or something, do you immediately refer to uh, the psych uh, department po or are there are there any interventions before that uh, referral happens? How, how do you deal with those patients po? Uh, actually, okay, get in. Um, in our hospital, Sometimes it's the attending who refers to psych or the patient asks for it. But as healthcare workers, which means doctor, nurse, whatever, it's just talking to them. What's the concern? What seems to bother you? And that will exp they, then they might have certain things that they've gone through they don't understand. And I, one of the things I say is how, how, how my life changed. One day I just had this flu and now I'm intubated and prone, and I can't even urinate. What went wrong? If a stroke, I think that was a stroke. Ako di, medyo tanggap ko yan sir. Na ano? O na bundul ako ng kochi, tanggap ko rin. But this one is just I had this bad cough. I kept coughing and coughing, and I can't breathe. All of a sudden, I need to call. I can't breathe. Not because somebody's sitting on my neck, but because I can't breathe. <laughs> you know, mm. but okay, it's really, uh, but it's really. Scary for patients. Now, wala naman yes, ginawang masama. And to, and, to, and to that note, I think that relates to the other question from Rachel Cacho po. Uh, she is asking if uh, those kinds of effects po uh, are usually rooted in the fact that uh, you have a prolonged ICU confinement and not uh, no studies have actually or no evidence suggests that it is a direct effect of uh, having COVID na po. Um, right now, what we're seeing is mainly due to the confinement. But it's because you are in a situation that you, the doctor wants to put them in a regular room, but he can't. The vent has to stay, or he has dialysis, or he has other things going on. They can't transfer the patient, so they have to really wait. And sometimes the delay occurs because the patient is so unstable. I mean, kahit sinabi ko, two to three days pwede yung rehab. Eh, doctor, yung presyon, naglolo ko masyado, mabagsak. Very volatile. I'll be the first to say, but there are things we can do, I'm sure. Raise that hand now, and then after two hours, the other hand. And that can be done by anybody. Bend the leg up and down while you're toying with the line, licking the IV, draining the urine while it's draining, move the leg 10 times. You're, those little things will help our patients. Yeah. Excellent, excellent answer, Paul. Uh, Dr. Noel? Uh, one other question po will, will be regards to the long holders. Can you maybe describe what, what, uh, parang what will be the definitive parameters for you to be able to uh, be considered as a long hauler? And what, what usually, how, how, how many patients do you usually see na ganun po talaga? And what are the uh, types of advices that you uh, provide for these long haulers? Uh, the way I answer that question is, Many people suffer in silence because they they say the kasakit lang ako eh. and that's very. If you, so I said we as the we in the healthcare must be able to draw it out from them because they think I'm kasakit ako malu ba kaya ganto ko and they suffer in silence they don't do anything about it so it's being able to be aware and ask them how are you that's why right now we're trying to follow up how are you right now so we're trying to all the patients we've sent home. Tanong lang namin, kamusta na po ba kayo? What's going on? Are you better? Then take it from there. But the long haulers are these people who are the ones who don't go to the hospital. Diba sabi nga, ang rule, diba? Yung 80%, tatawag, ay, dyan lang kayo sa bahay po. Yung kayong gamot, nagparasetamol kayo, kumain. Yung that, that typical, if they go to the ER, uwi na lang ho kayo. Okay lang yan. Then you have to start getting them to come back or to call us to see, alam mo, hindi pa ako gumagaling. Ano magagawa ko? Then the sad part is there's no magic pill. It's really a work of everybody. In fact, when they say about the post-COVID, it's not a typical rehab situation. Apparent. Sige, you work until you get tired. And in day, it is a different form. To push them to keep working. See, typically, if you're injured, diba? like you, takbo. Sige, pilitin mo yan. ACL lang yan. Yung we start pushing, we start getting the body strong. Say, you cross that barrier, you set this landmark. For them, it's a lot of back and forth. Parang, ano, napagod ako. Sige, atras naman kami so it's really understanding and the physician not getting frustrated. So it's really understanding each other. 
na parang it is a long process. I'm here to help you. Tsatsagain lang natin yan. And the, uh, the patients I see are seen by other doctors, the internists. Kasi bubutan sila, should they go? They don't go to us. Because they don't know us. So they go to the pulmo or the infectious. No, doctor. And then the doctor should tell them, ah, ganun. Then maybe we can help you in this regard. Kasi ay, wala yan. Sige lang, tiisin mo lang yan. Ganun lang yan. Kasi pulmon lang yan. Eh. Yung that kind of situation. So he's trying to be more open and trying to see maybe there is something going on. Thank you, Dr. Noel. Uh, Dr. Susi, uh, questions yeah. from your side po? Uh, you know, Noel Tony Dance is listening to us right now. And he's saying, uh, he's suggesting that we have a rehab training program for front line liners so that they can address the rehab issues. What do you think? Um, how, do, how do I answer that question? Um, I think people have to be aware that because yeah. the you know, the Okay, how do I, okay. You know the conversion I attended? What is an ideal patient? Someone lying down and quiet. That's the ideal patient. Yung papatulog, papahinga. Yung ganon. <laughs> Let's work it. Eh. Okay na. That's not the way it is. Sir, alas doso. Si Dr. Ho, kamusta na kayo? Yung ganon, ay tulog, wala tayong gisingin. Eh alas, alas twist ng hapon, sir. Kamusta na kayo? I mean, that kind of thing. And it's just being mindful that we have to rouse them. It might be irritating, but it will help them. The, the training is just having that mindset, but they can be trained as to like to move patients. Para I said, whose responsibility is it? Maybe after we've started the work, if the patient is so problematic, anybody can do it now. When you have to do okay na yan. Tulungan lang natin kasi nga, hirap. You see, there are three of us moving the patient. Baka the nurse, you can call the other nurse and then the other aide. Para tatlo kayo. Kasi when the rehab comes in, usually may aide yan, may, may PT, tapos may isa pang dati na PT tutulog. Kasi sabi niya, pari, mabigat yung pasyente. Oh, yung ganun eh. Eh, yung nurse, mag-isa lang siya eh. Oh, hindi ko kaya yan, mabigat siya eh. We still ask you to help each other. Then, oh, sige pari, when you help me, I'll help you with your patient. So, ganun lang. Yeah, okay. So, great. So, I think, I think we can think of ways of making that making that happen. I think this webinar is the start of uh, a continuing discussion on the role of rehabilitation in the management of COVID. And um, Noel, uh, we'd like to keep you longer and there are more questions, but we know you're very busy. So we'd just like to ask you for a few uh, closing remarks, reminders, or a message to those who are listening. And, uh, oh, oh, sorry, we have to answer the questions. Thanks, Raymond. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes, Pa. So, uh, for the questions that were given by uh, Dr. Bate, uh, this question, Pa, is one of our, uh, these questions are our pre-webinar questions. Uh, question number one states the optimum time to start rehabilitation for COVID-19 patients confined in the ICU is? Ano po ang sagot, sir? Should be the first one in the ICU. Okay. The sooner we get them, in the the ICU. Thing, get them up and about, the better for them. Okay. Thank you. Pero many people like to think it's in the bottom. Yung mga, pag nasa regular floors na lang, para ano. Early, no? Early, early intervention. Early talaga. Early, early intervention early. po. And then for the second question, I think this was one of your last words po, Dr. Noel, during presentation. Uh, check as many as you can. Uh, mobilization of COVID-19 patients is the responsibility of? So, everyone. Yes, everyone. Okay. Everyone. Thank, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Noel. And with that, I think, uh, are there any parting questions or did you want to answer one more question? Because this, this one is, I think, is particularly interesting. I'd like to yeah. tie up with uh, Napo, no? with your anecdote with regards to your 39 year old patient who was uh, well uh, well at the top of her fitness level so to speak and then after uh, the covid hit her uh, it was very difficult for her to even do four hours of work from home the question uh, is about um, are there any uh, have you ever seen any full recovery spot for covid-19 patients and in terms of disability uh, what are the chances of permanent disability, Paul, with regards to the patients that you have seen uh, of the, my COVID-19, Dr. Noel? Yeah. Well, at this point in time, I can't answer that. But what do I mean? COVID is new. It's something we're going to work on and learn more as the days go by. Diba? Like I said, dati yung 
age ang criteria ng CBC. Na hindi na kasama age. It's more your, what are you sick of? Yes. That's the problem. Not the age anymore. Yeah. Then, the patients were seeing kasi, like one of the patients that has recovered, we did a six-minute walk test. Kasi, naglakas loob eh. Medyo bagsak. But I'm just saying, but like I said, it's fair. But all I'm saying is, there is work to be done. And that's it. There's work Great. to be done. But there is light. It's not hopeless. Do not think it's hopeless. Yeah. Kami, in rehab, we gave our patients up to a year to work. If there's still progression, we push and push. But you have to be very patient. You have to do patience. Have to do, you have to do it yourself too. It's like learning any skill. You'll have to do it on your own and not rely on just your therapist or your doctor. Then you have to be parang open to suggestions, looking for ways around the situation, giving time for exercise. Kasi nga, di ba, after a while, parang busy na ako eh. Dahil mo ginagawa eh. Hey, it's that. Great. Okay, Noel, just a parting message for everyone. Uh, COVID is doing crazy things to all of us. The only thing we have to, the only way we can beat this is really working hard, helping each other, yeah, being safe. Because it is true that this is very infectious, but for the, those health work, healthcare workers who are going to go in and help them, be very safe. First, protect yourself before you help them. And then when you remove your PPE, please be very careful. Think. And then, but, but, but having said that, when you're in the room with your patient, kahit na nung, you're the nurse, you're the aide, you're the doctor, try to get them to move a little. Encourage them. Say nang sa ICU. Once it's in the regular room, kasi nga, that's why I have this pet peeve with hospital beds. I don't like them at a certain point in the patient's life. Ano yung kamay tinataas? If I could have some instrument to disable that, I would do it. Why? Kakain tayo. Iupo ho tayo. Yung kama, umakit. Sira ho yung kama eh. Upo kayo. Kakain tayo. I mean, di ba? Parang ganun lang yan eh. It, it's looking for, say that hospital bed really becomes a curse after some time because it's nice to raise that and watch TV and you know, have the food tray on your lap and eating. Uh, bakasyong grande pa rin ah. That's why it's really helping each other, becoming mindful, and then starting to move. <laughs> Great. Well said, Dr. Noel. And it's been um, fascinating to listen to your presentation. I think we all learned <laughs> a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And you know, your, you also. your team in Medical City is cheering for you in this chat box. <laughs> so they're all very proud of and the you. the BRP. When Yes, yeah, yes, yes. Lang, yes. Lang, yes. Lang, so, tuwan sila and tuwan din kami. Maraming salamat, Dr. Bate. Okay, so for everyone, thank you for being with us today. Uh, next week, we're going to talk to uh, an anesthesiologist. We're going to talk about COVID challenges in anesthesiology. So, we're going to have Dr. Grace Herbosa. And so, don't miss it. I know many of you will want to hear this presentation and to listen to what are the innovations that are being done by anesthesiologists to stay safe. Kasi sila talaga very, very exposed no? when they have to do intubation and all, all of these other <coughs> procedures. So uh, anyway, on behalf of uh, the organizing group of this webinar, I'd like to thank everyone and um, hope to see you next week. Let's make it a habit to keep on learning about how to manage COVID-19. Raymond. Thank you, Dr. Susie, and thank you to the nearly 275. Uh, I think there were, it was uh, at one point, it was more than 275 attendees po in our Zoom webinar. So that is how interesting the topic is and how interested they were in the topic presenter, Dr. Noel. So maraming salamat po for that, uh, for that uh, awesome presentation. And we hope to have you uh, in the future when we have, let's say, when we do our other webinar series. Maraming salamat po sa lahat at makita-kita po tayo ulit every Friday from 12 noon to 2 p.m. I'm Dr. Raymond Francis Sarmiento signing off. Uh, keep safe, keep healthy, and stay online. <laughs>